Okay, uh, so welcome to our last lecture. We'll get started momentarily. So that was uh, about a 10 minute video kind of showing or explaining how, how um, COVID-19 has sort of helped climate change, not made it worse. Uh, it's probably the one silver lining that comes from all of this. And uh, I mean, it's, I don't mean to downplay all of the other massively negative things that have come out of, you know, this global pandemic, but you know, sometimes it's good to not focus on the negative and it's good to just sort of, you know, remind ourselves that there's some good somewhere. And uh, so this video was, was uh, you know, kind of inspiring to, to see that, you know, now that we're all trapped at home and we're not all driving to work every single day, um, you know, there have been a significant reduction in greenhouse emissions. And um, although it's not totally sustainable to keep all the factories off forever, um, I think I think it's been sort of the wake up call that most of the world needed that, you know, hey, look, it's possible, you know, it, it's possible to modify your practices to be more environmentally friendly and still keep your business profitable. And, uh, you know, the economy is a lot like, like an object in motion, you know, Newton's first law, an object in motion wants to stay in motion. And, you know, the economy has been booming forward for, you know, decades, ever since our crash in 2008. And uh, there's, there's momentum there and people don't want to sort of change their practices because it takes effort and work and, it, you know, that doesn't happen naturally. But because of COVID, you know, it came in and it forced us to disrupt kind of how we do things. You know, it showed, it showed all like everyone who runs our economy that, hey, look, it's possible. It's possible to be reducing our emissions and also you know, pivot your, your business and still kind of make a profit. And, uh, you know, this, this video was saying um, that only about 9% of the people really want society to go back the way it was before, you know, so that means 90% of the population now uh, sort of agrees that we should be changing our practices, even when we're allowed you know, to, to return to normal, you know, 90% of the people are saying, you know, we should be actually doing more for the environment because we, we've been shown now forcefully, we've been shown now that it's possible. So, you know, all the politicians are, they're, they're no longer, no longer able to sort of hide behind the, the uh, fossil fuel industry, you know, now it's been proven that, you know, our, our economy can thrive without fossil fuels. So it'll be interesting to see kind of what happens moving forward. But um, for those of you who don't know, my, my background, my PhD is actually in atmospheric physics and climate physics. So, you know, I've, I've spent the better part of a decade, you know, researching climate change and the physics behind it and, you know, easy things that can be done to sort of combat it. But the reason we don't is because of politics. So this is kind of right up my alley right now. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. And, uh, you know, you can keep that on, sort of on the back burner. Um, the other thing I kind of wanted uh, for you to learn from this video or to see from this video is that innovation takes creativity, problem solving skills, and just natural ability to do science. And that's kind of why we're all in school. Um, you know, uh, I remember when I was in my undergrad, I, I just thought I was in school because I was expected to be in school and I, you know, I paid my tuition and, you know, I, I got pretty good grades in high school. So I expected pretty good grades in university, but very quickly I realized that's not what university was about. University was not about a piece of paper. It was not about just getting your A's or your A pluses or whatever grade you get. You know, the university is sort of the last step between your sheltered life and the real world. And in the real world, there's, there's not gonna be any of these nickel and diming for grades or do I get part marks or do I get extra time? In the real world, when you're an employee, your job as an employee is to make that company make money. Right, the, the company is paying you for your brain and you have to take your skills and make the company money. At the end of the day, if you can't make that company money, you're, you're out, you know, don't let your ass, don't let the door hit your ass on the way out. Like they will fire you pretty fast. So, you know, I realized that pretty quickly in university and I sort of changed my mindset toward my learning then. I think it was around second year when this happened with me. And I stopped in second year, I honestly stopped caring about my grades. I didn't care what grade I get. I didn't care if there was three tests in one day or one test in one day, or I didn't care, right? To me, I was there to learn. And all the test was is it, it's, it's a way for me to see kind of where my learning is at. 
And if I didn't do well on a test that told me I'm not able to do physics. And if I'm going to go out into the world and get hired and, and claim to the world that I can do physics, I would better be able to do physics. You know, now granted, you're not all in here to do physics. You're in here to do, you know, life science or medicine or forensics or what have you. But you know, but there's a reason you're in the physics class is because you will need to take physics to, to, or you will need to do physics in, in the career path you're headed for. So if you get into the workforce and you can't actually perform at the level they need you to perform at, you could be getting 99s in, at U of T. It's not going to matter. If you can't do it, you can't do it. And, you know, this global pandemic has really, really shown, you know, how scientists are needed to just critically think and problem solve and be creative. And it really shows that scientists need to be able to do, not just be able to, like, take a test properly. So um, two birds, you know, I want to show you two things. One, the climate change aspect, and you can start thinking, kind of reflecting about, you know, personal practice about climate change that way. And then two, you as a student, you know, hopefully in the next five or so years, you'll be done university and you can actually be part of these sort of working force scientists working towards solutions to some of these global problems, but you need to be able to actually do the science in order to make a difference. Anyway, enough ranting about that, um, or I guess life teachings about that. Let's move right along. Um, I want to show. Uh, I want to show everyone. Um, there is. I made. I made um, assignment five due at midnight. Let me find it here for you. So a, a lot of you guys have been asking about an extension for assignment five, but. And my fault as much as, as everyone else for not realizing it. Um, when, when students were asking, they were saying, you know, can we have it extended like a day or two? Even a day or two would help a lot. And that told my brain, uh, okay, I'm not allowed to do a day or two because that pushes us into the exam period. Um, and university is pretty, pretty strict about that. We're not allowed to um, push it into the exam period. So, um, I didn't think of it, but someone, I think one or two students noticed that it was due at 7 p.m. So instead of having it due at 7 p.m., we can have it due at 11.59 p.m. So please keep that in mind. It's not midnight, it's 11.59. So according to the computer, 11.59 and three seconds is considered late because the three seconds beyond 11.59 is beyond 11.59. So the due date is 11.59 and zero seconds. I have no ability, if you look here, I have no ability to add 59.59. I can't say in 59 seconds. Uh, Canvas doesn't allow me to do that. So um, it'll be due at 11.59 for everybody. Um, hopefully that extra few hours will help. I've been telling everyone very frequently, especially recently, but through the entire course, Yes, the assignments are difficult. Do you know why they're difficult? It's because they're marked. You guys can talk to each other. You guys can Google. You know, um, if we made them just standard textbook problems, everyone would just look up the textbook solutions and then everyone would get perfect. Education is not about getting perfect. Education is about learning. Learning happens when you push your brain as far as it'll go, you get stuck, and then you become unstuck by asking for help or doing some readings, and then that's when you learn something. So I've been telling all the students the entire semester, push yourselves when you get stuck, reach out. And uh, this past weekend was amazing. I've, I've been constantly doing emails in Piazza, like almost without break. So that's really good. That means you're reaching out finally. But you know, this whole semester has gone by where students just haven't been reaching out. And I think that's led to sort of feelings of frustration, but that's why you're supposed to reach out. You know, if you reach out and you tell me exactly like here, Mark, here's where I've, I've got, I'm stuck. I don't know where to go next. I set up my equations, but this is what's catching me. That's when I can come in and be like, yeah, this, you're, you're forgetting that Z can be swapped out for root two GH or something like that. And I think a lot of you have been experiencing this sort of help over the weekend, you know, where you email me, I swoop in and help. Uh, I would have loved for this to have been the case throughout the whole semester, but you know, I guess it takes some time to sort of convince you guys asking for help is okay. Googling solutions is not okay. So I think we're finally at that point now where you, you, you realize you can ask for help. Your TAs as well. You can always ask your TAs for help. Um, and uh, I think they're, they're paid two hours of office hours each week. 
And from what I gather from the TAs, very few of you have been emailing your TAs for, for actual help beyond just, I'm, uh, you know, can you remark my question, blah, 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 or something like that. But, you know, very few of you actually email your TAs to actually have a sit down with them and say, could you explain to me how to do this textbook problem? So anyway, that's where we are. I just want to say there is an extension for assignment five up until 11.59 in zero seconds. Um, and with that said, in the spirit of sort of showing students and guiding students, um, I think we're going to spend, uh, there we go. I think we're going to spend most of today doing some midterm review, uh, sorry, um, review for the exam. Uh, I think it would make more sense. Come on there. I think it would make more sense to spend a little bit of time on the midterm, just to sort of briefly go through that to sort of show you, um, it wasn't as hard as everyone inevitably always feels after a midterm. Um, we had similar feelings after midterm one that, you know, you walk out of the test and, you know, you always think it's doom and gloom and it's, it's so hard. Um, that's true with every test, whether it be online or in person, everyone always thinks when they walk out of a midterm, um, it's really, really hard. And then when we take it up, you see that, okay, it wasn't that bad. Um, and for whatever reason, you just didn't perform uh, up to your own personal expectations on the test. Maybe it's because of stress and you blanked out. Maybe it's because when you were studying, you were trying to memorize solutions and you weren't actually trying to understand the solutions. So if I, if you apply it to a different set of circumstances, you know, all of a sudden you're confused for whatever the reason, um, it is, it is common for students to walk out of a test and, um, and, and feel these sort of feelings of, oh man, I did like, I did shit on the test. So um, as per usual, let's quickly go through and uh, we'll, we'll very briefly discuss the solution because I want to spend as much time as possible on uh, studying for the, for the exam coming up on Friday. Um, okay, so without further ado, let's just run through this. So um, question one, Mark had a wireless keyboard um, and, and this is actually true. I bought a wireless keyboard. Um, it just, its connection was actually shit. So half the time I was typing, it was missing half my keystrokes. And then ended up like as a click backspace, backspace wasn't working. So this is totally based on a true story. And as of, I, I actually did this in real life, I didn't climb up on a ladder, but what I did was I, I walked out to one of the, um, the, the balconies in Davis and I dropped it off, uh, I think a third or fourth story balcony and I watched it hit the ground from like three or four levels up. Um, so this is actually inspired by true events. So the question is, can you calculate the force of the keyboard by the ground during the collision? And um, there's sort of two ways to approach this, um, two main ways to approach this. So I asked students to sort of look at this two different ways. And um, you see, um, we talked about the force required to stop a car in lecture. We talked a lot about that actually, how much force is required, how much force of friction is required to stop a car if you slam on your brakes. Same premise here, how much force is required to um, stop a car or to stop this keyboard as it hits the ground. So we know work done equals uh, force times displacement. This equation tells us that you cannot stop an object instantaneously, that it has to actually decelerate over a non-zero distance. So if you rearrange for force, we see that that's gonna be the work done on the keyboard divided by the distance. Now the work done on the keyboard we know is gonna be MGH because MGH gets turned into kinetic energy uh, right before impact, but one half MV squared is gonna equal to uh, MGH. So we can just say the work done on the keyboard will be MGH. But this, we don't actually know um, the distance over which it collides. As the, as the keyboard collides with the floor, it will depress the floor some non-zero amount, and we just don't know what that amount is. So um, we're almost able to calculate the required force, but not quite. Um, this is analogous to like someone throwing a baseball. And when you, when you catch a baseball, if you can picture yourself doing this, or catching anything for that matter, baseball or other object, when you catch it, you sort of cradle the object and you kind of let it come back into your body. You do this because you're elongating the distance that you're stopping the object over, reducing the amount of force on your hands and your wrists. You do this when you jump too. Like let's say you make a little leap off of a little ledge. When you land, you bend your knees. There's sort of springiness in your knees. You do that to sort of elongate the collision. If you, if you jumped off a little ledge and you keep your knees stiff, you'd probably break an ankle or break a knee, right? So that's what that equation is saying. The other way to study this is using momentum concepts. 
you can say that the change in momentum is going to be F delta T. So this is impulse. And we say the change in momentum is, is simply zero minus MV. Uh, using energy, you can obtain what V would be before a collision. So we, we are able to get that, and that would be F delta T. And we can say the required force is going to be MV over delta T. Again, uh, there's something we don't know. We know M. Oh, I'm not able to change my color. OK, well, we know M, we know V, but we do not know delta T, the time over which the collision takes place. In fact, the, the distance over which the collision takes place and the time over which the collision takes place are very related to one another. If you had D, you could find T. If you had T, find D. So that's the answer to the first one. Um, the second one is very similar to uh, the last multiple choice question on the previous midterm. I think it was multiple choice question nine on the previous midterm. Um, this one is very related to that. So this one pretty much says, um, uh, let me just read it to make sure. Yeah, we're testing an assumption. Um, you know, half the time when we do um, torque or rotational questions, real life objects do not fall into like a nice category. Like real life objects are not uniform rods, right? So we often make an approximation and you've seen this sort of thing in, in, um, in a lot of questions you do, you know, assume the lawnmower blade is a, is a thin rod. Well, clearly in real life, it's not perfectly a thin rod, but is it a good approximation? Now, if we tell you that in a textbook question, you can probably take it for face value, but the whole point of being trained in physics is for you to start making these sort of critical assessments on your own. You know, when you're not in the umbrella of a physics class and we rubber stamp you saying, yeah, you got an 80 in physics, you should be able to, to, to sort of make these reasonable assessments on your own. That's what this question is about. So for instance, um, here we're saying if, um, if um, hold on, given your knowledge of a normal, oh yeah, yeah. So here uh, I take the tire or the wheel, the tire off of my car. And the, um, let's say I, I want to pretend the tire is a thin hollow disc, meaning all the mass is sort of assumed to be concentrated uh, on, on the perimeter. Um, how might I test this, assuming I don't have fancy lab equipment? You know, I can't, the answer can't be, oh yeah, you, you apply a torque, measure the torque, divide by alpha, find I, blah, 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 blah. Because like, Yes, that would technically work in a lab, but there are much easier ways to sort of test this, and that's what the question is getting at. So the answer to this question is take an object that you, you know for sure is either a, a solid cylinder or a hollow cylinder, um, something without question. So for instance, you know, if you take a garbage can, for instance, a garbage can is completely hollow by design, because you know it's designed to hold garbage. So if you take a garbage can, all the weight is distributed along the perimeter. So if you let a, a garbage can roll down a hill, then its moment of inertia, you know, is going to be that of a hollow, a hollow cylinder and larger than a solid cylinder. So if you take my, my car tire, which is an unknown, we don't know if, it's, if, it, if nature will allow us to approximate it as a hollow cylinder. If you take my car tire and you take something known to be a hollow cylinder and you let them both roll down a hill, then according to the conservation of energy, the one that's going to reach the ground first is the one with the, with the smaller moment of inertia. So the car tire, if the car tire reaches the ground first and it's racing against something that's hollow, then you know the car tire in real life cannot be approximated as hollow because you can experimentally, very easily experimentally tell when in a race against something hollow. So it does not behave like something that's hollow. Uh, similarly, if it's racing against something solid and it, it ties with something that's solid, then you know for sure it can be treated as something solid. If it's racing against something solid, and it loses against something that's solid, then that tells you it's not able to be treated like a solid, and then thus it being hollow is more valid. So that's what this question was mostly getting at. Um, the, the answer to part A is discuss briefly the validity of this claim. Um, that's fairly easy to do. Um, 
you know, your, your, your gut instinct tells you that if you take a car tire off of, of the tire or off the car, um, there is some, there's a lot of mass actually like the rim of the tire um, that is not concentrated at the center. So your gut tells you that it, it probably is a bad approximation. And then the answer to part B is to just describe how you would test your gut instinct. It's to just roll, roll a tire down a hill uh, your driveway, for instance, is often sloped, so you could even use your driveway and roll it down uh, with something else that you know is either hollow or you know it's solid. Okay, um, this question here, uh, we don't have a lot of room on the actual paper, but that's okay. This is why we can write over here. So this question here was the first full solution question. It was mostly a momentum question. So here um, it says that you have uh, two pucks on a frictionless lab bench, which of course nothing's perfectly frictionless, but for this, for the purposes of this question, we assumed it was frictionless. And uh, we don't know the initial speed of puck one, but we do know that there was a puck that collided uh, with a stationary puck and they collided elastically and then puck two flew off and then puck one rebounded and was traveling left and then um, flew off the left side of the table and puck two flew off the right side of the table. And the only piece of information we really know is that um, object two is initially stationary and we know the ranges of the resulting kind of uh, projectile motion. And we sort of had to reverse engineer what to do there. So um, first off, I would uh, trust the physics. I would trust that, you know, the question is designed in such a way that we will eventually have everything we need. So playing this through like a movie, I'm thinking to myself, okay, the pucks collide, collision, 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 that's momentum. And right in the question, it says it was an elastic collision. And we've done a lot of elastic collisions in class. And uh, specifically a main theme in momentum is that an object will collide when object two is stationary. So that is true here, object two is stationary. So an elastic collision with a stationary object, a uh, second object I should say, uh, allows us to use our derived uh, velocity equations. So on the formula sheet, you didn't even have to derive them, they're on the formula sheet. It says V1 prime is M1 minus M2 over M1 plus M2 uh, times the initial speed V1. Granted, we were not given V1. So this is me trusting that eventually things will work out. V2 prime on the formula sheet says uh, 2 M1 over M1 plus M2 times the initial speed V1. So there we go, that's the first part. I now know the speed at which puck two launches off of the side of the lab bench. I also know the speed at which puck one launches off of the lab bench. So that's the first part, that's fairly easy to deal with. Um, the second part then is handling the projectile motion. Now projectile motion was, was one of the first things we learned in this class. So what do we know? We know that V1Y is equal to zero, and the pucks get shot off horizontally. And we know, we know the range, um, delta dx, we know the range. So, um, you know, if we, if we had a coordinate system, I would say this is positive and you know, let's say up is positive, whatever one you really wanna do. So um, in our equations here, I know that V1 prime is gonna be negative because it's going backwards. And um, that means mass two will be bigger than mass one because M1 minus M2 would then be negative. So I could say, um, there's a question here. I actually, I don't know is, uh, hold on. I don't know if, if uh, Oksana is, oh yeah, Oksana's here, okay. So maybe, maybe Oksana can, can take Anne's question there. Okay, um, so for here, we can use our kinematics equations and uh, we know that V1Y is equal to zero. Uh, hold on, let me just say check mark here. Oops. We know, we know the range, we know V1Y. We know the acceleration, oops, the acceleration in the Y direction is equal to G, um, and we know VX. So using these things, we can say, you know, delta DY is equal to V1Y T minus one half G T squared. Uh, we know this is equal to zero. 
Uh, we know delta dy is negative because it's falling. So there is that. So, um, you know, you, you, can, you can reverse engineer kind of how, how we go from there. Um, you end up getting, um, you can get something for t if you want. Uh, the other thing you can do in the x direction, this is, sorry, this is for the y direction. Um, in the x direction, you know the acceleration, this is all for the y direction. Uh, in the x direction, you know the acceleration is equal to zero. Um, Vx is equal to something that we know. Um, and t, we need to know t. So in the x direction, it's actually very easy to analyze. In the x direction, you have Vx equals d over t, vector, vector. And we're solving for t. So this is going to be d vector over v vector. And um, here we know delta d in the x direction is going to be negative because it's backwards. Um, as you can see here, the distance traveled is, is to the left. So it's going to be negative 2d. And vx, we know what vx is. vx is m1 minus m2 over m1 plus m2 v1. And then we can do the same thing for the second puck. The second puck, um, the time of travel is delta d over vx. And um, delta d for the first, uh, for, sorry, for the second puck is traveling to the right. So the right is considered positive. So this is going to be d over vx is 2m1 over m1 plus m2 v1. And the time of flight for the both pucks is the same because they're falling from the same altitude. So you can actually equate these times together. The time of flight is the same as one another. So then you get the equation minus 2d over m1 minus m2 times mass total v1 equals, what was this equation? It was d, oops. It was d over 2m1 mass total v1. And then you see here, you can uh, cancel, cancel, and uh, you're, you're well, oh, and you can cancel the Ds. And you're well on your way there to um, finding, finding M, what was it, M2 they wanted, given M1. So after you cancel everything, the only thing that's left is minus two um, equals M1 minus M2 times two M1. And you know, you're, you're well on your way there to solving for um, M2. So I think M2 will equal five M1 once you're done. So that's that question. Um, question two, question two, uh, I should have inserted space. So now it's going to be a little bit broken. Let's see if I can move, hold on. This is where the lasso would come in handy. Whoop. Let's move that up over there. Okay. And I'm just going to insert a little bit more space here. Oh, no. Come on, move down. Okay. Oh, draw. Okay. So question two uh, is also kind of true, but not totally true. I don't actually walk around with a pole, but you know, when I do go for walks outside to get some exercise and I see someone coming at me, I do actually just turn and like walk on the grass, just, you know, social distancing and stuff like that. So I kind of turned that into a question. So um, here, uh, the first part of the question is, is just um, rotational statics, or what we call, I guess, equilibrium. So I'm just carrying a six foot pole that has what a weight of, I don't even care, oh, four kilograms, not that it matters what the weight is. Um, and I just, I'm asking students to figure out the force required um, by my hands. So, you know, first you would draw a free body diagram. You have the force of gravity located uh, halfway at the pole. Um, you have the force of uh, my, my hand that's forward, whether it be that my left hand or my right hand. And then at the pivot point, you have my force of uh, this hand pushing down. So 
you know, picture yourself carrying a broom, you know, just like a long pole. Uh, if, if you're trying to hold the pole with two hands, um, one hand, the hand closer to the center of gravity obviously has to pull upwards. But um, if you didn't have your other hand and you just pulled upwards, the whole thing would go upwards. So your other hand needs to be behind your hand to push down to provide a counter torque. And then that way you can hold it level. So that's how you can easily figure out that one hand has to push down and one hand has to pull up. Um, it was also in the diagram that the hand in front was pulling up. You saw that arrow in the diagram uh, of the arrow pulling up. So that it, it explicitly told you that. So here we've got the pivot point. So um, we just use torque. So we say the net torque is equal to zero. Um, the, the premise in the first question is that I'm holding the, the pole horizontally as I'm walking. So it's not accelerating angularly or otherwise. So um, now we just sum the torque. We say the torque due to um, F2, that would be counterclockwise. So that's positive. Um, we have the torque due to the center of gravity. Um, the center of gravity is pulling clockwise, so that would be negative. And um, we have the torque due to F1. But you see that the torque due to F1, F1 is applied right at the pivot point. So the torque due to F1 is zero. Um, so it's really only the torque due to my front hand that is preventing this thing from rotating. Um, the, the force from my other hand is, is allowing me to keep it elevated, but is not providing rotation. So here, this is gonna be the force of my uh, hand that's closer, closer to the center of gravity, multiplied by the lever arm for that, um, minus mg times the lever arm of the center of mass, and this equals zero. So this tells me that the force of that arm has to be mglcm over lf2. And putting this in terms of variables that are stated in the problem, this is going to be mg and lcm is going to be the length of the pole over two. And the uh, lever arm for my arm is going to be delta x. It's the one meter. Um, it's the one meter separation between my hands. So overall, it's going to be mgd over two delta x. That's going to be the force of my, my hand. Now, that's only one of my hands. My other hand uh, is also providing a force, so we're going to need that. So that's when we use my other, or not my, that's when we use the other condition for equilibrium. So in lecture, we talked about when things are in equilibrium, we used to say that that meant A is equal to zero, and F net would be equal to zero, like, subsequently. But we did, we talked in, in class that we have to redefine equilibrium because if something is accelerating angularly with, a, with an alpha, then the net force is zero. You've got something pushing up, you've got something pushing down. Um, so F net is zero. But if you have something pushing up on the right and down on the left, you're going to cause the same rotation uh, counterclockwise. So it's going to cause a torque. So both of them had to be zero to be called uh, equilibrium. So we implement that now. We know the net force has to be zero. And when you do forces with free body diagrams, the location of the forces no longer matter. So here we just say F2 is up, force of gravity is down, uh, force of my hand is down. So it would be F2 minus uh, Fg minus F1 is all equal to zero. And going through that, we say F1 is going to be equal to, let's see here, Mg minus F2. What was F2? Mgd over 2 delta x. So this is going to be Mg1 minus, uh, did I forget a negative? Oh, these should be plus, sorry. Oh, no, no, no. Let's see here, uh, F1, oh, sorry, this should be minus and plus, sorry, minus and plus. So this should be um, D over two delta X minus one, there we go. So I think you should get something, if you plug in all your numbers, I think you should get something along the lines of like 12 G for this. So 12 G is about 120, if you assume G is 10. So something shy of 110, maybe 118 or something. 
And then F1, when you plug in all your, your numbers for F1, you should get something like um, 78 newtons. So that's that one. It's a, a fairly standard um, application of, of equilibrium. And then B, uh, how strong does Mark need to be if I want to raise the pole with a certain angular acceleration? So here we go back to the torque equation. Torque net uh, is going to equal I alpha. And alpha is not, uh, alpha's not zero anymore. Alpha is four now. Um, we already know from before my backhand does not contribute any torque to it. So this is going to be torque due to F2 minus the torque due to the center of mass is going to equal I alpha. So um, force uh, two times delta X is going to equal I alpha, oops, I alpha minus mg um, d over 2. And the moment of inertia of a rod pivoting around uh, one of its ends, you can use the parallel axis theorem. So it's going to be 112 m r squared plus m, oh, I guess I should say m d squared, um, plus m d over 2 squared. So that's parallel axis theorem. Um, overall, it turns out to be one third md squared. So uh, at one third md squared is quite common. So um, you know you may have already known that ahead of time. Although technically, I didn't give you that on the formula sheet. Uh, I gave you one one over twelve md squared, and I gave you parallel axis theorem. So uh, I was sort of expecting students to demonstrate parallel axis theorem there. Um, alpha minus mg. Oops, mg d over two. F2 delta X. So from here, you can simply solve for um, F2. I think if you solve for F2 and you factor out everything and you cancel things as, as you can, you're going to end up getting M, MD over 6 delta X times 2D alpha plus 3G. So there's your final equation. And if you plug in everything, I think you get around 310 newtons. It's like 309 point something. So um, I just rounded it to 310 because it's just nicer to look at that way. And um, the last question, the last question, um, there are two, two ways to solve it. Uh, one way would have taken longer uh, and one way would have been much faster. Um, if you chose to do it the longer way and you got it correct, beautiful, um, you'll get the marks for it. Um, for the students who were sort of more well versed in the connections between the chapters um, and they did it the fast way, um, they would have saved more time and still gotten the correct answer. And that, that's really the whole point of this question is there are two ways to do it. One is like much longer and the other one is much quicker. And um, the whole reason we use energy is to, to bypass some of the complexities of, of coupling dynamics and kinematics together to get an answer. You can do everything all in one fell swoop using energy. So I intended for students to use energy uh, for, for this question. So uh, A here, what is the speed of the object V after it falls a distance delta X? Um, the premise is you have a solid disk that is being pulled down by a block of mass M. Um, the, the mass of this disk is capital M and there's a known radius of the disk. Um, you know, go ham pretty much is the question is, is find, find the speed of the, of the object V as it falls. So um, here we can set up conservation of energy. Um, it starts off with gravitational potential energy and it finishes off with uh, two types. The block itself is, is moving down. So there'll be some kinetic energy in the block. Um, but then the giant wheel, the giant reel is also rotating. So that gravitational potential energy was transformed into two types of kinetic energy, both ten, uh, linear kinetic energy into the block and rotational kinetic energy into the wheel. And then we simply just expand mg delta h equals one half little m v squared plus one half i omega squared. And we just keep going here. 
Um, we're asked for the speed of the block after it falls. And uh, that tells me we need to get rid of all of our angular quantities and represent our angular quantities in terms of uh, tangential quantities. We've done lots of examples of this in class. Um, so that, that shouldn't be anything new for you. So one half I, what is my moment of inertia of a solid disk? My moment of inertia of a solid disk is one half M R squared and omega. If you recall, oops, different color. If you recall, um, V equals R omega. So if I'm swapping out omega, it's going to be the tangential speed over R. And here we see the R's will cancel. So one half little m v squared plus one over four um, capital M v squared. So this is going to be, let's factor out v squared over four. And this is going to give us little m two, oops, two times, two times little m plus capital M. And this equals mg delta h. So then v is going to equal um, two times the square root of mg delta h over twice little m plus capital M. So there you go. It's, uh, you know, conservation of energy can only can only really get so complicated. Um, once, once you get sort of the structure of your conservation of energy, like once you get the sort of initial setup uh, where you can explain kind of where the energy goes, um, it's, the rest is mostly just algebra to be honest with you. It's just once you get the, the correct starting equation, you're just kind of uh, expanding, expanding, expanding uh, slowly and slowly and slowly. So, um, you know, that, that's the answer to part A. Um, part B was more of a concept question. What did part B say? Part B said, um, if the solid disk that we, we did have were to be replaced with a hollow disk with, let's say, the same mass, um, would it take longer or shorter or the same amount of time for that object to fall the same amount of distance delta x? And, um, you know, the, the question the question is, is a concept question and you say, you know, a hollow, the answer to B is that a hollow object has a higher I value. So if you have a higher I value, um, more, um, more energy will be diverted. Diverted is perhaps not the, quite correct words. I'm going to put it in quotes. Um, more energy will be diverted into rotation and stolen from the kinetic energy. So um, if you have a larger I value, more energy, more energy of the MGH is, is diverted in, in, uh, into one half I omega squared, making one half MV squared smaller and then that means you have less speed. So overall, it'll take longer because it will be traveling slower if the, if the disk has a larger I value. Um, also, you can think about this in real life. You know, if you have, I don't know, if you have something small, like a small pulley or something, you, you drop some string over it, um, it's, it's gonna be pretty easy for it to fall. But if you have, a, you know, a, a, all of the mass uh, distributed uh, of this pulley di distributed on the on the ends, you can feel that it, it, even if you try to move it, you can feel it's going to be harder to get to get rolling. So um, if you're applying the same force, and you are, you're applying little m times g. If you're applying the same force to get the pulley moving or to get this mass rotating, uh, it's not going to rotate very easily if most of the mass of a pulley is concentrated along the perimeter. So um, part B there was a sort of a concept seeing how well students just truly, truly, truly understood uh, the implications of moment of inertia. Like, do you actually understand that if you have the mass concentrated on the outside, it's harder to get moving? So those were the three, those were the three full, full solutions questions. 
um, in a nutshell. Um, you know, part A here was not that many lines, one, two, three, four, five or six lines, most of them was just because I was showing my steps. Um, part B was only a few sentences. Um, let's see here, the previous question, the previous question wasn't too bad. It was uh, part A of, of question two was, there was two main parts to it. It was um, uh, tau net equals zero and f net equals zero. Each of them respectively was only about four lines. Uh, pretty, pretty standard for a f net equals zero and tau net equals zero. Um, part B was again fairly standard. Instead of tau net equaling zero, it was tau net equals i alpha. Um, so just because that zero isn't there doesn't really make the question any any harder. Uh, it's the same setup as before. It was f two minus uh, f two minus the the um, torque due to center of gravity, just like before. So you're piggybacking on on the work you've already done there. Um, and the what I what I would think is the hardest question was was problem one, and half the question was just copying the formulas from the formula sheet because it was an elastic collision with one of the objects um, initially at rest. Um, the hard part about question one is, I, I guess, assuming or trusting that the object uh, that that the solution would was properly structured and and things would cancel as you needed them to cancel. Um, sometimes that sort of faith in in physics isn't isn't quite developed in students until they've practiced a lot. Um, I learned very early on that, you know, if, if my physics prof is giving me a problem, odds are they know what they're talking about and I should just trust, trust that the question is, is valid. So, you know, right from first year, I, I would just do the questions blindly. Say if I didn't have a variable, I would just say, screw it, I'll deal with it later if, it, if it's still in there. And 99% of the time, the variable would cancel out. And I'd be like, all right, see, there you go, I didn't need it anyway. So that would be the hard part about question one, but the other ones I think were, were fairly straightforward. And the, um, the short answer questions above, I think they, they wouldn't have, uh, I, there was no curve balls in there either, I don't think. It was just a, a pretty standard application of, of, F, of F delta D for work and impulse, as well as um, you know, seeing if you could actually do things in real life. Like if in, in real life, if you didn't have a textbook in front of you, um, how well do you actually understand the concepts to sort of make a, a real life conclusion? So, okay, anyway, there's, there's your midterm in a nutshell. Um, I do want to save some time for uh, exam practice, but before we move on, um, I'm going to look quickly at the chat and I think, yeah, Oksana has been diligent. Um, thank you, Oksana, for taking those questions. I'm looking at the chat now, so if anyone has specific questions, uh, for me about the midterm, I'll take them now for a few minutes and then maybe in three minutes or so we'll transition to, to exam prep. No? Okay, well, it doesn't look like there's any questions from the midterm, um, at least, oh there. Can you do the first short answer? I thought I did, it's, it's right here. Oh, now, now OneNote is frozen. Of course it's frozen, don't buy Windows. Come on. We're, okay, it's still, oh, okay. Okay, so here's for, for work equals F delta D, and you don't have delta D, um, so you're not quite able to solve for the force, but you're close. Um, the other way is using momentum, that the change in momentum is equal to force times delta T. Uh, you know the change in momentum, but you don't have delta T. So it's the same, sort of the same problem as, as when you study it with energy. Okay, any other questions from the midterm before we move on to the exam? Uh, for, for short answer two, don't the masses have to be the same to test their moment of inertia rolling down the hill? Ah, um, it doesn't actually. Um, we know that the, we know that the final velocity at the end of the hill doesn't depend on mass. Um, 
And I know when, when we do that analysis, we compare that actually, well, here, let me just do it for you. So here, um, let's say we had gravitational potential energy at the top and we had kinetic plus rotational at the bottom. But this, this looks very similar to the conservation of energy equation that we had in problem three, but it's a little bit different because in this question, the same object that's rolling is also moving forward. So it's the same mass. Uh, in both of these terms here. So here, this would be um, one half mv squared plus, um, let's assume it's a solid disk, for instance. So this would be one half i uh, omega squared. And then after canceling the relevant things, you're gonna get one half mv squared plus one over four um, what is this? M V squared. And this is going to be M G H. So the M's cancel and you get one half V squared plus one over four V squared. And you see that V squared is going to equal what? Two over four. So this is going to be three over four. So it's going to be four over three G H square rooted. So you see here that the speed of, of a solid object at the bottom of the hill is not a function of mass. It's just a function of moment of inertia, right? It's that coefficient in front, whether it's one over two MR squared or, or one MR squared or three over five MR squared, the M's will cancel. It's the coefficient in front that matters. Um, if you had a hollow disk, then MGH would equal one half MV squared plus one half I omega squared, and this is going to be one half mv squared plus one half mv squared equals mgh. So here you're going to get, um, let's see here, v equals root gh. So here you see that something that's solid will actually be traveling slower because root GH is, is less than um, 1.3, a uh, root 1.3 times GH. So um, to, to put that into words or into math, um, root four over three GH is actually larger than root GH. So things that have a, a, a smaller moment of inertia will end up traveling faster and thus beat anything else. And you notice here in the equations, it's not a function of mass, it's not a function of radius. Um, it's not a function of length of the cylinder. So if you had a, a short cylinder, uh, a short light cylinder, uh, racing a, a massive large cylinder, as long as the two cylinders are solid, they'll reach the ground at the same time, um, which is kind of fun. Now, I, I showed everyone a video of this with Walter Levin uh, racing objects down a ramp. So that was actually part of the lecture as well. But anyway, you could. It falls out of conservation of energy that mass doesn't matter for that. That's a great question though. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, so it's two o'clock. We have about an hour left. Um, I would like to ask you guys, I've posted um, as is U of T tra tradition, um, I've mentioned, I think, in my announcement that instructors don't actually legally own their exams. It's kind of weird. Um, a University of Toronto examination is, is a very regulated process. And the Office of the Registrar is responsible for scheduling the exams, not me. Um, and there's a, you know, a huge amount of regulations with, with exams. And um, we don't actually own them they own the exam and what an upside to this is they're actually they've chosen because they have the intellectual rights to those exams what they've chosen to do is they've chosen to post them on an exam repository for all u of t students doesn't matter what campus you're from scarborough st george or, or mississauga so um all of the past exams are are readily available online thanks to the office of the registrar so you can actually look up all the past exams um, I'm going to ask you, this is the fourth time I'm teaching the class, so there's three previous exams that are posted. I'm going to ask you uh, right now in the chat, is there a preference? Actually, let's, let's do this. Um, 
if everyone just starts typing, I'm not going to be able to, to see what's happening. So let's say um, A, let's see, 2017, um, B, 2018, C, 2019. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch a poll. Launch poll. There we go. So you should see on your screens now um, a poll. Obviously, ignore, ignore um, D and E. But I want to see your votes. Do you want me to start working on um, exam 2019, exam 2018, or exam 2017? And whichever one is the Democratic winner, um, we'll, we'll just start doing the, in the hour that's remaining. Half of you have voted. There's about um, 34 of you out of 60. Forty of you out of fifty-nine. Some, somebody, somebody jumped out as as we were doing exam review. I, I hope that's just a, a an internet um, problem. I, I hope they did. I hope they're not like, okay, yeah, exam prep. I'm done. Forty-four, forty-five out of fifty-nine. Oh, 60, Okay, yeah, someone came back. Good. Must have been an internet problem. Okay, I don't know where the other 13 of you are. There's 47 out of 60, so I don't know where the other 13 are. Um, I, I think I've waited over a minute now. So uh, let me show you the results. So an overwhelming majority, 80% of you, voted to take up 2019's exam. So um, I don't want to ignore the other people, but if the other people have um, pressing questions from previous exams that are not 2019, you can always post them on Piazza or email me um, you know, if this weekend has proven anything, it's like I do respond to emails ridiculously quickly when possible. So um, for the people who want previous exams, unfortunately, you can email me them. But for now, it looks like democratically, um, we will we will do 2019. So let's give you your screens back. Stop sharing. Uh, and let's just pop on over to the 2019 past exam. So um, the, this past exam had 14 multiple choice questions on it. Um, I will tell you with, with definitive certainty that you will only have 10 multiple choice questions on it. Um, I'm sure we've all known or seen from midterm one and midterm two that um, the online nature of these multiple choice questions, there are, there are typos in the solution sometimes and sometimes the wording of the questions aren't great. That's only because every single one of you have a different batch of 10 questions. So I'm not making 10 questions, I'm actually making 10 times 130 questions. That's like 1300 questions. So um, yes, there are gonna be typos. It's an incredibly large amount of work for me. Um, so instead of doing 14 questions to make my life worse, I'm only doing 10 questions to make my life a little bit better, but mostly to minimize how many issues you have with the multiple choice questions. And of course, after the exam is completed, um, I will encourage you all to review the solutions to the multiple choice questions as well. So you can email me if there are any issues as well with those. But you will only have 10 multiple choice questions. Okay, moving on. Let's kind of review these multiple choice questions. So which is not true about an order of magnitude estimation? It gives you a rough idea of the answer. Yes, that is true. Oh, let's not do black. Let's do, oh, come on. All right, we might have to do black. Yeah, okay, whatever. We're doing black, I can't, I can't change my color. Um, it can be done by keeping only one significant figure. Yeah, mostly, and that's pretty much what we tell you to do. Um, put it into scientific notation and keep one significant figure and then whatever corresponding order of, of 10 that corresponds with it. Um, it can be used to check if, it, if, it, uh, if a precise calculation is reasonable. Um, we call this a sanity check. Yes, you've seen me do this in lecture quite often. Um, it's definitely useful to make sure you're kind of in the right ballpark. Um, it may require making some assumptions. Yes, of course, we assume G is around 10. Um, you know, sometimes if you're doing back of the en envelope calculations like you saw on uh, assignment one, sometimes you have to assume some populations like what's the population of Mississauga? It's around a million, you know, stuff like that. Um, so I guess by process of elimination, you know the answer is E, but let's see why E is wrong. Um, 
it will always guarantee you your answer is accurate within 15%. That's false. There's nothing, there's nothing in there that, that forces the answer to be within 15% accuracy. Um, that's just demonstrably false. Okay, um, B, you measure the mass of a piece of wood to be 500 plus or minus 15 grams and its volume to be um, 0 0.83 plus or minus whatever liters. What is its density? Okay, well, density is gonna be mass over volume. So we know we're gonna get um, density in kilograms per cubic meter. Okay, so this is gonna be 500 plus or minus 15 grams. So it's gonna be 10 to the minus three kilograms over volume 0 0.83 plus or minus 0 0.03 liters. But uh, density is in kilograms per cubic meter. So um, this is also gonna be times 10 to the minus three to convert. So the 10 to the minus threes will cancel. So, um, you know, we're gonna get 500 divided by 0 0.83, which you know has to be bigger than 500. So let's look here, what's the only value bigger than 500? It's either D or E. And then the next question is, um, which one is correct? Is it 602 or is it 600? Um, it might actually be 602 if you perform that division, but if you look, um, the uncertainty is in the tens decimal place. So reporting something into the ones decimal place is incorrect. So um, you would have to report it like, uh, like that. Now here, three, three small balls, uh, A, B, and C are launched with equal speeds on different tracks as shown. Um, friction and air resistance are negligible. Uh, the times for the balls to reach the right side of the tracks are, are TA, TB, and TC, respectively. Which answer gives the correct ranking of the three times? So here, the ball moves through the whole distance D at speed V. The last one, the ball travels at speed V here and speed V here, but here the speed prime is actually larger than V, right? It goes down a hill, so it speeds up. So it actually travels most of the distance at a speed faster than V. So this will actually get there faster. And here, same thing, it will speed up here momentarily. So it's traveling fast, but over a shorter distance. So the answer here is gonna be TC is uh, smaller than the time for B is smaller than the time for A. So where is that one? Mm, C, where is, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I, um, I forgot about acceleration. I jumped the gun on that one, sorry. Um, here, it accelerates down here, but as it, as it climbs the other side, it will decelerate. It will decelerate. So um, those will sort of balance out as well. Um, which answer gives the correct ranking of the three times? Time A, oh, sorry, no, I was right. It was, it was right here. It was right there, yeah. There it is, TC, yeah, I was reading it backwards. There it is right there. So yeah, that's that one right there. Um, four, two identical blocks of weight W are placed one on top of another as shown. The upper block is tied to the wall as shown right here. Um, can I change my color yet? Nope, still not letting me, lovely. Okay, um, where are we? Uh, block W, right, tied to the wall as shown. The, upper, uh, the lower block is then pulled to the right with force F. The coefficient of static friction between all surfaces is mu. What is the largest force that S can be exerted before the lower block starts to slip? So um, simple free body diagram. We have the force of friction from the bottom. We have the force of friction from the top. 
and we have the applied force F. And um, all you do is you, you assume that the sum of the forces is equal to zero and you just go nuts. So uh, here the force of friction from the bottom plus the force of friction from the top has to equal the applied force. The force of friction from the bottom is going to be uh, mass total mu mass total g and the force of friction from the top is mu um, or I guess weight, I should say weight, weight total. Um, this is going to be mu times weight equals F. So this is going to be three mu weight equals F. So the answer is C. Okay, um, 1.5, a car is traveling on a road in a hilly terrain. Assume the car has speed V everywhere and the tops and bottoms of the hills have radius R. The driver is most likely to feel weightless where? Well, we know at the bottom, um, it's gonna feel heavier than weightless, uh, weightless much heavier than weightless. Um, not just much heavier than weightless, but much heavier than MG. Um, you're most likely to feel weightless somewhere at the top of the hill. And um, let's see, let's see where. So bottom we can cancel out. Um, going down the hill, no. Um, so it's either A or D. Without doing anything really, we know the answer is either A or D. So the question is, is it bigger than root RG or is it equal to root RG? And you'll remember that if an object is traveling in uniform circular motion, the way in which you feel weightless is when there is no other force acting on you other than gravity. So at the top of the loop, the only force that acts on you has to be gravity. So mv squared over r has to equal mg. m's cancel, v is equal to root rg. So the answer is going to be d. If you're traveling faster than root rg, then there has to be an additional force uh, applied on you to keep you in circular motion. And, and in this context, that would be the seat belt. You know, if the car goes over the hill too quickly, um, your body would want to elevate um, and then the seatbelt would have to pull you down. So you would feel a normal force downward from the seatbelt on you. And then you wouldn't feel weightless anymore. You'd feel like there was a, a, a force acting on you from the seatbelt. But if you were traveling over the top of the hill at root RG, then the seatbelt wouldn't have to do anything and you would get the, that butterfly feeling uh, in your stomach. 1.6, you and your friend both solve uh, a problem involving Sonny Bono if you don't know who Sonny Bono is, that is Cher's ex-husband. Um, I'm also completely in love with Cher. I think she's the best singer of all time. Um, unfortunately, Sonny Bono died during a ski accident, so it's sort of a morbid question. Um, anyway, um, the, t the two of you have chosen different points of reference for the uh, gravitational potential energy to be zero. Which of the following uh, quantities would you still agree on? So maybe I'm claiming the top of the hill has no no gravitational potential energy and then as you fall down the hill you have negative gravitational potential energy and maybe a friend of mine says no 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 Mark the bottom of the hill is zero and at the top of the hill is positive. Gravity is relative or I should say gravitational potential energy is relative depending where you want to call zero. So those claims inherently are not false. I can say the top of the hill is zero. My friend can say the bottom of the hill is zero. That's fine. However, uh, we have to make sure we're consistent with our analysis. So which of the following will be the same? Sunny's change in EG. Well, the change in gravitational potential should be the same. Final minus initial. Um, Sunny Bono's final kinetic energy. That should be the same as well. Um, Sonny Bono's kinetic energy and gravitational energy. Um, and oh, what do we agree on? The kinetic energy, the EG, and the change in EG. Well, I don't think that would be true. The change in EG, my friend and I would both agree on. The EK, Sonny speed, we would both agree on. But we would not agree on Sonny's current gravitational potential energy. I'm claiming as Sonny Bono travels down the hill, 
um, he would have like a negative uh, gravitational energy because zero was at the top of the hill. So as he goes down, he'd be negative, he'd be in debt. Uh, my friend would say the bottom of the hill is zero and they'd say, oh, well, as sun is coming down, he's got positive gravitational energy and it's just shrinking to zero. So C is what we would not agree on. Um, which of the following quantities would you and your friend, oh, agree on? Okay, so this one we wouldn't agree on. Um, Sunny's, Sunny's um, EG and final EK. Uh, we wouldn't agree on this, but we would agree on this. So overall, we would not agree on that. Um, Sunny's change in EG and final EK, we would agree on that. So we would agree on E, we would agree on B, and we would agree on A. So the answer to this one would be A, B, and E. Okay, um, 1.7. A student took before and after data of two carts involved in a collision based on the data. Uh, based on the data, the best explanation is carts had elastic, partially inelastic, totally inelastic, well, okay, right off the bat, you know it's not totally inelastic because after they're moving at separate speeds, so they didn't stick together. So um, without doing any math, you can eliminate C right out of the gate. Um, the carts collide with a compressed spring magnet which add kinetic energy. Um, you'd have to test that. Um, there must be a non-zero external force since momentum is not conserved. Um, so we can eliminate C right out of the gate. Uh, something tells me we can probably eliminate E as well because momentum is, is conserved and there's no notion in the question here that there's an external force happening. So let's just do it. Let's just compute the momentums. So momentum total is going to be 9 times 3 minus, oh, okay, uh, minus, uh, let's see here, 1 times 3. So this is going to equal 8 times 3, which is, is that right? Yeah, 8 times 3, which is 24. And then after, P total prime is going to equal 1 times 9 plus 2 times 6 plus 2 times 6. So that's going to be, um, let's see here, 9 plus 12 equals 21. Ah. Okay, so momentum isn't conserved, which tells me there must have been uh, some sort of non-external, non-zero external force. So there you go, the answer is E. And you can tell simply by just checking, checking the momenta. And I, I don't think I messed up my calculations there. I mean, three times nine minus three, yeah, 27 minus three, yeah, 24, and then nine plus six. Yeah, 12, yeah, okay, there you go. So there must have been some sort of non-zero external force because momentum wasn't conserved. Um, 1.8, the block shown, now what time is it? Okay, you know what, we'll, we'll, forgive me, we'll come back to the multiple choice if we have time. As useful as I think it is to go through the multiple choice questions, I think you're gonna learn more if we do the full answer questions. So um, we'll come back, where did we leave off? We left off at 1.8. So let me do the full solution questions first for you guys. And uh, if we have time, we'll come back. Um, what are you guys saying in the chat? Just to make sure we're on board. Okay, yeah, cool. Okay, so here you've got a question with um, free body diagrams. Um, this is nice because this is a physics class, not a math class. And um, on an assignment, yes, on an assignment, that's, that's our chance, both of our chances, to get our hands down and dirty. You know, can you, can you actually do physics well enough to get to a, a final answer, right? Um, that's kind of what the real world needs. Um, my job is to assess your physics abilities. So an exam is like an exit test. An exam is to sort of test, test your abilities, leaving the class, how well you learn the concepts from the class. An exam's purpose is not, is not the same as a midterm. An exam's purpose is not the same as an assignment. An exam's purpose is to simply check how many of the curriculum checkpoints you, you can demonstrate. So um, this is a physics class, and uh, most of this class, I'm sure if you look back on it, is your ability to, to start a problem, your ability to take your physics knowledge and, and write your starting equation. Once your starting equation is on the page, the rest is just algebra. So 
Um, what this, this section here, section two, is testing you on is your ability to set up the physics and then walk away. So um, for instance here, uh, we're having you do free body diagrams, F net equals MA, and then walking away. So for instance, um, I mean, we could be here a while because there's a lot of these, but you know, like the blocks, for instance, uh, the free body diagram for block A, oh, that's a starting equation. The free body diagram for block A, we have tension this way. Uh, we have normal force up. Um, we have gravity down. Do we have friction? Yes, kinetic friction. So if block B moves this way, then um, the uh, block is going to move, block A is going to move backwards relative to the bottom. So friction is actually going to be forward. And I think that's all for block A. For block B, we have tension backwards. We have the force F. Uh, we have the friction from the bottom backwards. And we have friction from the top backwards as well. So there's your free body diagrams. And then uh, I asked you to do F net equals MA and then just walk away. So um, for, for block A, we would have tension minus force of friction equals MA. We would have normal force minus gravity equals zero. Uh, for block B, we would have force minus tension minus force of friction from the top minus force of friction from the bottom uh, equals M. And there you go, simple. And then, and then just walk away, right? That's the physics. The physics is knowing how to draw the free body diagram, knowing what F net equals MA is, knowing the forces. The rest of it is just algebra. So, you know, set it up and then walk away. Uh, something like here, for instance. Um, here's the question, at what, at what rate must a cylindrical ship rotate, blah, 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 to simulate gravity? Okay, well, you know, the premise of the question is, um, it's the gravitron, right? You have, you have a cylinder that is uh, rotating and you have an object in here that is rotating with the cylinder. So the only force acting on it would be the normal force. That's it, right? Um, that is what simulates gravity. Um, the starting, oh, I suppose, sorry. I suppose I should be drawing this here, the normal force. And then the starting equation, F net equals MV squared over R, would be the normal force equals MV squared over R. And then walking away. Yes, there's more to the question, obviously, but the point of these are not to actually solve the question. The point is to just set it up and then walk away. Um, a yo-yo is released from rest, from blah, 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 stationary rod, okay. So we have a yo-yo, we have tension, we have force of gravity, um, that's pretty much the whole free body diagram on that one. And then you go torque net equals I alpha and F net equals MA. So you have, um, you know, you pick, this is your pivot point right there. So you say torque equals I alpha. And then you say, um, torque due to the center of mass equals I alpha. And then you also have F net equals MA. So you have tension minus the force of gravity equals MA. There you go, you've, you've set it up and then you just walk away. So um, we'll be there a while if I do all of them. I don't wanna do all of them. Uh, I will say if you um, scroll down to the bottom, there was an appendix to this exam right here that demonstrated kind of what I was looking for for the question, just to emphasize to students that I wasn't looking for a solution. I just wanted you to set it up and then walk away. So like, here's an example of, of kind of what I was looking for. So like, you know, horizontal beam is shown and its center of gravity is at its center, blah, blah, blah. Calculate, calculate the force of tension. Okay, don't actually calculate the force of tension. Set it up and walk away. So like, here's the diagram. Here would be the free body diagram I wanted students to draw. And then here is a pretty standard application of um, torque equilibrium and uh, translational equilibrium. So torque equals zero, net torque equals zero, net force equals zero, sum the torques, sum the forces, walk away. Okay, so um, there's 
there's that there to consider as well. Okay, moving on. Oop, sorry, zoom, zooming issues. Okay, so full solution. Let's, we got about half an hour left. Let's see how much we can do. So in the figure, uh, a solid brass ball of mass M will roll smoothly along uh, the loop-to-loop -loop track and is released from rest at a distance height, blah, 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 blah. Okay. What is the formula for H if the ball is on the verge of leaving the track when it, uh, when it reaches the top of the loop? So uh, we've done lots of examples like this in this class. Um, you pretty much start start with circular motion first and then reverse engineer it from there. So um, they, they want H. How high do you have? Can I change my color yet? Oh, I can change my color now. Yay. Oh, crap. Okay. I'll use blue or, yeah, I'll use blue. So the, the premise here is it's on the verge of leaving when it reaches the top of the track. Well, if you draw a free body diagram, what does it mean to be on the verge of leaving? It means there's no normal force from the track on the ball. The only force acting on it would be gravity. So that tells me we've done our free body diagram, then we do F net equals MA. My net force is gravity. My MA, it's centripetal acceleration, so V squared over R. MG equals MV squared over R. Cancel, cancel. So V is going to equal, or V squared is going to equal RG. Okay, so how does that help me? Well, what are we asking for? We're asking for, what is the height? Presumably, the higher I drop this object, whether I drop it down here or I drop it down here, uh, will change the speed at the top of this loop. So that tells me energy. We're having to relate the initial drop height to the speed at which the object has at a certain moment. So that tells me energy. So I can set up my conservation, oops. I can set up my conservation of energy equation. What kind of energy does this object have initially? Oh, I'm drawing a diagram. It has only gravitational energy. And that goes down here at the top here, at the top of the loop-to-loop. -loop. What, what kind of energy does it have? Well, it still has, oops. It still has a little bit of gravitational energy, assuming we take the ground to be zero, which is natural. Um, but we also have some motion. But um, now it kind of depends how you interpret the question. But um, we are told that it rolls smoothly down. So, this is also going to have rotational kinetic. So there's three types of energy it has at the top of the loop-to-loop. -loop. So we're going to expand this. MGH equals. Now, what kind of energy height does it have at the end? Well, it's, a, it's two, two times the radius above the ground. So MG times two times the radius. Um, kinetic energy, one half MV squared plus uh, rotational, one half I omega squared. Now the question here says it's a solid ball. Okay, so let's take a pause. Solid ball. So a solid sphere has moment of inertia of, of uh, 2 over 5 mr squared. Where am I? Scroll, 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 scroll. Oh, here we go. Okay, so um, this is going to be mgh equals 2 mg plus 1 half mv squared plus 1 half 2 over 5 mr squared v squared over r squared is solid, right? Yeah, solid. Okay. And uh, 
there you go. You, you pretty much just solve. Um, we know, we know V squared is RG and R's will cancel. So we just kind of go ham. We have um, two MGR plus one half MRG plus twos cancel. So this is going to be what? One over five M. Oh, V squared. V squared is RG. So there you go. The M's cancel. M, 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 M. And divide everything by G and you can solve for H. So H equals dot, dot, dot. There you go. So that's the answer to A. Uh, again, it's a fairly straightforward setup. Honestly, once you get this, once you get this far, the rest is practically just algebra. Um, B, the ball is released from a height, from a height of six times the radius. First components acting on the ball at point Q. Where's point Q? Oh, point Q is at the side, okay. So this is point Q. So a free body diagram, oops, different color. A free body diagram at point Q is we're going to have the normal force um, in, in that direction. And we're going to have the gravitational force down. Um, what are we asking for uh, of the horizontal force? Okay, so we don't actually care about gravity, but whatever. It's, it's in my free body diagram, but the question isn't asking for the vertical component of the force. So it's only asking for the normal force. Okay, um, so here I am. I'm saying, all right, well, F net equals MA. The net force is the normal force and MV squared over R. Um, What's V? We know R, R is in the question. Um, what's V? Well, again, we can use E total equals E total prime. And uh, again, we have EG prime plus EK plus E rotational. And um, now we're only, a, um, here's the center. So now we're only a distance R up. So this is gonna be MGR plus one half MV squared plus one half I omega squared MGH. We have H, so now you can solve for V and then you can plug V squared into there. So you set it up and walk away is kind of what I'm doing now, right? So you're starting to see the idea that um, this, in physics there's this blend between like physics knowledge and your ability to do algebra. So, um, you know, because of time, I'm not going to carry through the algebra, but I set it up for you. You know, here, here's the equation you need, and then you just simply rearrange for V. And plug. So um, I've done the physics for you. I'll leave you to do the algebra. What is the ball's angular momentum at point Q about its own axis? Well, angular momentum is I omega. We know I. I is 2 over 5 m r squared. Omega is v, oops, v over r. So this is going to be 2 over 5 m r v. And we know the speed. We know the speed from the previous part. So you can just plug it in that way. OK, so that was uh, the first. Multi, uh, the fir first full solution question on last year's exam. Um, moving forward, so here's the next one. This one is sort of a blend between uh, momentum and simple harmonic motion. So this one depicts an object. Ooh, what's happening? This one depicts an object colliding with a, a stationary mass uh, attached to a spring and um, then it oscillates after the collision. So we want a, a, an expression for mass two given everything else in the problem. So here we're given mass one, what else are we given? We're given the speed at which it collides. 
Uh, we're given the spring constant. We're given the period of oscillation. And we're given this height here. Okay, so they want uh, an expression for M2. Well, the easiest way to do this, they, they tell me the period of oscillation. They tell me that. So the period of oscillation is going to be 2 pi times the root of m over k. Now, if you don't remember that from class, if you scroll down to your formula sheet, um, here in the waves part, you're told that the frequency of oscillation is 1 over 2 pi times root k over m. And you're also told that the period is 1 over the frequency. So you just have to flip the frequency equation, and then you can get the period. So scrolling back up. Oh, here we go. That's how we got this. And then I just asked myself, is there anything here we need? Yeah, it's M2. So solving for M2, we're going to get period squared times k over 4 pi squared. And um, there's no unknowns there. We know period, we know k, 4 is a constant, pi is a constant. So we're able to find mass 2 um, without too much trouble. So that's why it was only worth two marks. What is the speed of m1 after the collision? Ah, so this one is um, slightly more difficult. But again, we realize that, let me just erase all my check marks. It's an elastic collision, and block two is not moving initially. So we can use our derived um, momentum equations for v, v1 prime and v2 prime. So the speed of mass one after the collision, that is simply asking for v1 prime. Well, v1 prime is going to be m1 minus m2 over m1 plus m2 v1. However, uh, we're not given m2 in the question. We are given m1 in the question. And we're given v1 in the question, but we're not given m2 in the question. So if we're asked for a formula, which we are, uh, we need to have a formula in terms of all of the values stated in the problem. So. Uh, and I was looking over some of your, your um, historic assignments that you've been submitting. Um, there's a lot of students that still are resisting my advice with that. You know, you're plugging in, uh, you're plugging in values prematurely, and you're not getting final derived equations. And you'll notice on all the tests, I'm asking for final derived equations and then a value. So not only are you going to be losing marks for not giving me a final derived equation, Sometimes you're actually going to lose marks because if you plug in values prematurely, you're actually going to get wrong answers. And that's because of rounding error. So um, please just take my advice. Try to get a final derived equation. Um, that'll solve a lot of your problems. So here, uh, M2, we know M2 from before. So M1 minus period squared K over 4 pi squared all over m1 plus period squared k over 4 pi squared v1. And you could leave it there, I suppose, although this, this looks a little bit messy for my liking. So I can multiply everything by, um, by, by 4 pi squared, and I can get 4 pi squared m1 minus period squared k over 4 pi squared m1 plus period squared k all times v1. Uh, so for me, that just looks a little cleaner because then there's no compound fractions, but the two equations are, um, are the same. OK, um, C, what is the value for omega? Again, we're told uh, in the formula sheet that omega is 2 pi times the frequency, which is 2 pi over the period. So um, you have the period. The period in the question is 0 0.14. So 2 pi over 0 0.14. And what does that give you? That gives you, it's going to be around 40. It's going to be around 40. 
I don't have a calculator with me at the moment, but it's, it's going to be around 40. Uh, and the units for omega is radians per second. That's approximately 40. It'll be a little bit higher than 40, actually. Um, what is the range of the projectile? Okay, well, presumably, um, after colliding with uh, block two, um, the resulting velocity will be negative. It'll be backwards. Um, so it will slide off the edge of the table here with a certain velocity. This is a very similar problem to what we had on, on this past midterm on Saturday. Um, we have V1 prime. I asked for V1 prime in the previous question. Um, uh, this thing here was V1 prime. So we have V1 prime, and then you can just easily do your, um, your um, uh, kinematics equations with, with that as well. So we know the time of flight is going to be based on the height that it falls. So the time of flight, if you solve, is going to be um, 2h over g. Uh, you can get that with, oops, delta d equals v1t plus one half a t squared. So you, you, can, you can find the time of flight that way because the initial speed is zero. Once you have the time of flight, then you can say vx equals the range over um, time. And um, this would mean that the range equals, let's see here, v1 prime times the time of root 2 h over g. And there you go. You have, you have uh, this formula for v1 prime. You can plug it in there. Uh, okay, and then E is the last part. Um, how much farther would M1 travel if the mass were doubled? And the whole point of having you do a final derived equation is you can see uh, how, how things affect one another. Um, uh, if, if, sorry, if each mass were doubled, you can see, you can see from plugging everything in that uh, if, if every single mass was doubled, it wouldn't actually impact anything, which is, which is kind of nice on that front. But um, that's harder to do if you don't have a final derived equation. If you, if, you, um, if you didn't have that, you'd have to redo all the calculations separately, and uh, that would take a lot of time. And that's, that's obviously, quote, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's a trick or a trap, but you know, it's not a secret. I've been telling everyone all semester to make sure they have final derived equations because then you can kind of see the relationships between these variables uh, fairly easily. Okay, uh, moving on. So here's share again. Uh, I've mentioned before that I like share. So, um, you know, these are more concept questions. So share is driving a car traveling at speed V, uh, suddenly sees a brick wall a distance D in front of her. I think we had a question like this somewhere. I think it was on the midterm, I think. Um, it wasn't this past midterm. It may have been midterm one. I can't remember. Um, it was somewhere. It was definitely somewhere. I remember to, oh, it was in lecture. I remember talking about this in lecture. That's what it was. Um, it was, I'll find it for you, actually. Where did we talk about that? We talked about that here, right there. That's exactly where we talked about it. So we, we did talk about it in the energy, uh, in the energy lecture, right there. So where does that leave us though? Let's revisit this. Uh, suddenly sees a brick wall, a distance D in front of her. Um, this world is definitely not living, is worth living in without Cher. So we, we want to save Cher's life. Um, she's actually in her 70s now. I think she's like 72 or 74 or something like that. She's, she's getting pretty up there and she does not look like she's 70, but anyway. Um, so what's better for her? If you have a car that is traveling at a, a, towards a brick wall, what's better? Uh, what's more likely to save Cher's life? Uh, to sim simply uh, slam on her brakes uh, and, and not turn the wheel, or to turn her wheel in circular motion, but without slamming on her brakes. So the, the plan of action here is to see which one's more likely. Now, in both cases, the force responsible for stopping is friction. So 
we know with static friction, you can overcome static friction, right? You can, if you overcome static friction, it turns into kinetic friction and then they're sliding and then that's a problem. So really, we're trying to say which, which uh, scenario, breaking linearly or not breaking and turning, which scenario re requires a lower force? Because whichever force is lower, that's the one that is more likely to succeed. Now, maybe, maybe Cher is traveling slow enough that both of them would work fine. Maybe Cher is like me and traveling way too fast and, um, and uh, either scenario would cause slipping. Who knows? But the question is, which one is more likely? The, the, the phrase more likely means you're looking for the one that has less friction. Or sorry, you're looking for the one that requires less force so the force of friction has a better chance at working. So if we look at this, for turning the car, the net force is going to be the force of friction and uh, F net equals MA, so MV squared over R. So presumably, if she's turning, the maximum distance she has between herself and the wall is going to be the radius of motion. So that's how much, how much force is Cher going to need to turn her car? She's going to need mv squared over r amount of force to turn her car. Now, if she stops uh, linearly, then the work done is going to be f delta d. Now, the work done, uh, well, what work needs doing? Her kinetic energy needs absorbing. Her kinetic energy needs to turn into friction. So this is going to be force delta d. And if you solve for the required force, uh, the required force is going to be mv squared over 2 delta d. Now, delta d in this case is the, the distance over which she is allowed to break, and she is allowed to break over the distance r. So this delta d is, in fact, r. And it actually turns out that, uh, maybe I'll draw this in a different color, it takes half as much force to stop. So it takes not just a little bit amount of force, a uh, little bit less force to stop. It takes half as much force to stop the car with your brakes than it does to turn a corner. So uh, if, if you are driving and you ever find yourself in a situation where you need to stop really quickly or Let's say you find yourself in a situation that there's a something you want to avoid hitting, whether it be a brick wall, a child, or another car. Um, the physics is very clear. The physics says your best chance at stopping in time is simply slamming on your brakes. If you try to turn your wheel, you, you're going to need twice as much force to get the job done. And if you're going too fast, that might be the difference between hitting someone, um, hitting a brick wall, and hurting yourself or you know, hitting a person and injuring the person. So um, you know, when you are driving a car, it is really important you, you do understand the physics behind it. And there's a lot of physics in the car, as you've seen over the past semester. Uh, OK, uh, moving on. We're almost done. Um, this, qu this question is very similar to the example we did in lecture with, with myself spinning the bicycle tire. Um, discs have the same. Uh, uh, known to have the same kinetic energy. Uh, sorry, no, uh, two different discs are known to have the same angular momentum. There we go. Um, but disc one is known to have more kinetic energy. Which disc has the greater moment of inertia? Oops, I right clicked. Which disc is known to have, um, come on, the greater moment of inertia? Um, also, Mark is holding a spinning bicycle wheel while holding a stationary object. If he suddenly flips the wheel over, in which direction, if at all, will the table spin? Okay, so the second part, we covered verbatim from lecture. Um, the second part, I encourage you to go to, um, back to the angular momentum notes. Uh, you can either do it um, by looking at the PDF of the angular momentum notes, or you can look at the video again, but that's this right here, verbatim. It's exactly verbatim the same. So for those of you who say what we do in lecture doesn't relate to what we do in the midterm, that's demonstrably false. 
um, there's a lot of connections from the from the lecture to the midterms and exams. So the first part really is, is the new question. So let's tackle the first part. The first part says um, two different spinning disks are known to have the same angular momentum. Okay, so um, let's let's get away from red. Let's go back to blue for a second. So L1 equals I1 omega 1, and we know this has to equal I2 omega 2. That's what it means to have two different disks having the same angular momentum. So I1 omega 1 will equal I2 omega 2. But you know disk 1 has a larger kinetic energy. So you know that 1 half I omega, oh sorry, 1 half I1 omega 1 squared is larger than 1 half I2 omega 2 squared. And here we're asking which one has uh, a larger a larger moment of inertia. So um, here, the way we tackle this is we say um, kinetic energy is one half I omega one times omega one instead of saying omega one squared. So you can actually say this is going to be one half L one omega one, which is kind of fun. And um, there you can actually compare um, you can compare things so you know that the kinetic energy is is um, can be represented by oh um, that doesn't actually because we need I we need the moment of inertia so hold on let me back up we need the moment of inertia in here because that's what we have to compare so um, let's do this let's say let's say this one half I I squared omega squared over I. There we go. So this is the same. You can see this is the same here. I just multiplied numerator and denominator by I. So this is going to be one half I omega both squared over I, which is going to be one half L squared over I. There you go. So that's, that's what the EK is equal to. And we know that in both cases, the moments of inert, um, we know in both cases the L values are the same. So the kinetic energy for one is going to be one half L squared over I1. And we know the kinetic energy for two is going to be one half L squared over I2. And we know EK1 is larger than EK2. So in order for EK1 to be larger than EK2, then that means I1 is smaller than I2 by looking at the denominators. Okay, and the very last question of the exam is uh, another kind of thinking question. A ball is shot from and lands on the ground. It's shot from, oh, shot from the ground and lands on the ground. The figure gives the range R as a function of its launch angle. So R is on the y-axis, theta is on the x-axis. Rank the three points uh, on the plot according to total flight time, B speed, uh, oh, at maximum height. Uh, oh, and that's it, okay. So um, flight time, we know from lots and lots of practice, the time of flight of a projectile is governed by um, its, its um, maximum height that it achieves. So um, you're pretty much looking for, out of the three options, out of A, B, and C, which object will achieve a maximum height. So, um, they're all fired with the same, each one of them is fired with the same initial speed, right? So the question is which one out of the three angles, which one will result in the maximum height? Well, the one that will result in the maximum height is the one that has more of the speed in the y direction originally. That's the one that's gonna stay in the air the longest. So that's the one that has an angle of, of like high. You know, if you have an angle of zero, you're just shooting it into the ground. If you have an angle of 90, you're shooting it straight up. So um, C 
maybe if I draw a different color here, C has the largest theta, which means in option C, V1Y is going to equal V sine theta, and sine theta will be a maximum for, for object C. So C will be in the air the longest, and then subsequently B and then A. So the answer for part A is C, B, A. And then B is rank the three objects uh, as a function of the ball's total speed at the maximum height. Well, the maximum height uh, will occur when the, when the Y component of the velocity is zero and all of the speed is in the X direction. So we know the speed in the X direction does not change as the ball travels in its parabolic arc. So if you want to maximize the speed at the top, what you have to do is you have to maximize the Y component, sorry, you have to maximize the X component of the, of the velocity. So um, as theta goes up, the velocity in the X direction goes down, right? Um, so you want to minimize theta. So the answer to this one is the opposite. You want to minimize theta. So this one's going to be A, B, and then C. And this one had no, no reasoning required. So you could just, you could either guess, and if you happen to guess correctly, you could get the right answers, or you could think it through in your head. And as long as you got it, the, the, the logic correct in your head, you could save some time by not having to write it down in a concise, coherent way. You could just kind of write the answer and uh, get it that way. But that was only two marks, so um, it, it was only two marks because you didn't have to provide a reasoning, right? Okay, um, that was 2019's exam in under an hour. Um, now, keeping in mind, we did skip a few questions, and there was uh, one, two, three, four, five multiple choice questions we didn't do, but we did it in 50 minutes, right, instead of, instead of two hours. So you would have had over double the time to do this test. And the only things we really missed were five multiple choice questions and, and oh, actually that was it. Oh, five multiple choice questions and a few free body diagrams. So um, if I remember last year, I think the average on the test was about a, I think it was about a 53 or 55%. Um, so, you know, that's, that's normal. Like I said before, um, large first year classes with about 150 of us. So it's a pretty good sample size. Um, the laws of statistics, the law of large numbers, say when you have a, a robust random sample size, uh, and it, we're pretty random. I mean, none of you are physics majors, really. So, um, you know, if, if, you get a, if you get 150 physics majors together in a room and you give them a test, yes, the average should be significantly above a, a 50. But if you take a random sampling of a large number of, of, of data points, um, where there, some of them might be physics majors, most of them will not be, um, the average should be around a 50. That's, that's literally what, that's literally what a normal distribution means is, is, you know, we're normally distributed around, around 50. So for a, for a large first year class for an exam average to be around a 55, um, that makes total sense to me. And it fits with everything else. I mean, all other large, like first year calculus, um, their test averages and exam averages are, are around that as well, at least if the course is taught properly. Computer science, if you take a computer science class, they've got, actually, they have even worse averages. I think their averages for their tests and their exams are under 50. Um, chemistry, same thing. If, you, if you've taken chemistry with Chris or Poey, um, their test averages are in and around 50 as well. So um, it's not that I'm aiming for a 50. I never, I never make the exam, you know, hard enough to get a 50. That's not what I do. I, I make the exam in such a way that I'm trying to test curriculum points. You know, if you get an A on the exam, that means you walk out of this class um, fully being able to do 80, 85 percent of the material in your sleep backwards, you know, in your, in your sleep talking Spanish backwards, you know, like that's what getting an A on the exam means. So um, that's what that's how the exam is made. So um, please keep that in mind. The exam is not meant to be tricky. It's not meant to take you down. It's not meant to only have the smart people succeed. It's, it's simply checking curriculum points and using the law of large numbers. If everything is designed properly and as it should be, um, you know, the average performance of the class on a whole should be around 50, 
that's just what I mean. If you have a problem with that, then that means you just have a problem with 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 numbers. Really, you um, you've got a problem with math on, on on that side. So you know, if the average was significantly below a fifty, like a thirty, then yeah, there's something else going on. If if the average was significantly above a fifty, then that means the test was too easy, and we're not properly testing curriculum points. So um, you know, that's just please keep that in mind moving forward. Also with the with the midterm as well. You know, with the with a midterm average of 50, 55, 60, that's that's normal again. Okay. Anyway, uh, I'm going to open the chat briefly for a few minutes. I know we're a little bit over time. Um, does anyone have any specific questions about either this exam or, I guess, general? Because this is kind of the last few minutes of the course before the course is over. Oksana was just telling someone to save the question for the end. So whoever had that question, now is your time to ask it, I guess. Why wouldn't it be BAC for max height? Uh, well, B, BAC. Hit, uh, here we go. Uh, so we're ranking the ball's speed at the maximum height. We're not ranking the maximum height. We're, we're ranking the ball's speed at the maximum height. Uh, let me just pull up the chat question again to make sure I'm reading this properly. 3.3b. 3.3, oh, do you mean C then, 3.3 C? Because 3.3 B is the angular momentum question. Yeah, part C. So we're not, we're not asking you for the maximum height. We're asking you for this, this, the speed at the maximum height. Um, I agree with you that, that object B will achieve, well, actually, no, I don't, even, I don't even agree with you that object B will achieve the maximum height. Object C will achieve the maximum height because most of its speed is in, most of its speed is in the Y direction. And so, I, I mean, there, there's no part of that question where the answer is, is um, where, where are you saying B, A, C? I don't know, maybe you're getting confused because we're, we're not actually asking for the maximum height. Part A, we're asking for the maximum height, but part B, we're not. Um, maybe you're also confusing that this is, um, this is a range, not maximum height. Um, the maximum range will occur at 45 degrees. So presumably this is 45 degrees, but range and height are different, right? So may maybe you are confusing that. I don't, I don't really know exactly where the source of your confusion is. Right, okay, yeah, perfect. Any other questions? Either about your exam on Friday um, or what we just talked about uh, with this exam or the midterm. Can you please explain part C, part A, please? Um, oh, okay, that's, that's what Sarah just said she was uh, okay with. So part A says the ball speed, sorry, um, uh, rank them according to flight time. Flight time is a function of maximum altitude of, of the projectile. So assuming you've made that connection, really asking, ranking the ball's flight times is a fancy way of asking um, which ball will, will travel the highest, which ball will achieve the maximum height. And to get a maximum height, um, you're trying to maximize V in the Y direction. The more speed that is, is in the Y direction, the higher it will go. So, you know, VY is going to equal to V sine theta. So what theta value will maximize V sine theta? Well, 90. 
So we were looking for an object on this curve as close to theta equals 90 as possible. Um, that's, that's object C. Object C isn't exactly at 90 degrees, but it, it looks like it's probably at like 80 degrees or something like that. And that it's certainly the highest theta value compared to its counterparts. Object B is at 45 degrees, it's dead smack at the, in the middle. And object A is somewhere less than 45 degrees, whether it be 40 or 35 or 30, I can't really tell. Okay, perfect. Okay. Any other questions from the full solutions that we did? Um, you know, I, hopefully you're starting to see a pattern between like your test one, your test two, um, you know, this exam, like the solutions aren't long, they're not tricky. They're usually just a combination of like momentum and energy or momentum and kinematics or dynamics and kinematics. You know, there's, it's always like you know, two main themes in, in like one question that relate to one another. And that, that seems to be true in your midterm. Uh, you know, the, all the past exams will have this sort of idea to them as well. So um, they're really not that tricky. You just, you, you, in order to do well, it's not a matter of like, oh, I studied for 14 hours, therefore I should have got a 90. It's how are you studying, you know, are you, are you just brute forcing the questions in the book? And then when you get stuck, do you just flip to the solution manual and look at the solution and be like, oh, that's the formula, okay. Well, why is that the formula? Why weren't you getting the formula? What part of the question was getting you stuck? You know, these are all the things you have to kind of hammer out. And then that's when, you're, that's when the learning happens, right? So um, hopefully you, you can see from looking at the solutions and us taking up midterm one and midterm two, there's nothing in there that was overly tricky. It was everything in there was, was pretty much straight from the lecture. In fact, we do some pretty hard questions in the lecture. Um, you know, if we go back, if we go back to angular momentum, for instance, we did a pretty hard question. Where was it? Uh, it was right here. This was a pretty hard question. I didn't even finish it because solving for theta would have been a, a, a double the amount of work. Um, setting it up though, I set up half of it, which was the hard part. And uh, you know, that one, it was, it was a, a three star question. So that one was pretty hard. Um, you know, even in momentum, for instance, if we go back to momentum, we did this question here with the skeet. This one, look how long this one was. Like, look how much work that was. Look at it, it just keeps going and going and going, okay? Uh, we do do some pretty difficult questions in, in lecture to kind of show you how these, uh, how these um, chapters relate to one another. So, um, you know, those demonstrations do happen, um, but I can't do everything for you. Like uh, you watching me do the questions is not the same as your brain actually doing some of the more challenging problems from the book. So I, I can only do so much for you. Um, hopefully you're seeing when these solutions are being taken up that the midterms and the exams are not overly difficult. They're just, they require the student to actually understand the connections between the different, the different chapters and, and the concepts, the underlying concepts of the physics. So hopefully you can spend the next week. We have what, four days, four and a half days um, before the exam. I think the exam's what, Friday? I think at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I think if I recall correctly. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's what it is. So, you know, we have about four and a half days-ish, four days. So um, hopefully you've got time to sort of review. Make sure you try to sit down and actually try to understand if you are getting stuck, what part of the question was tripping you. Don't just say looking at the answer, okay, here I needed co here I needed cos theta and then writing in cos theta and then being on your merry way. Why were you missing the cos theta? That's what you need to address. So it's, it's more than just doing 14 hours of homework. It's, it's doing proper studying, not just brute force studying. Okay, um, I think I've ranted long enough. Uh, I'll get, ask one more time. Are there any other final questions? Can I ask you a question about assignment five? Yeah, go for it. Perfect time for a Jeopardy theme song. Do, do, do. Oh, wow, she already had a copy and pasted probably, okay. 
Um, I already posted my concern on Piazza about question one part D. Uh, it was the question with momentum plus conservation of energy. I made the conservation of energy equation with momentum involved, but I couldn't get the proper amplitude formula. I'm still stuck. Okay, well, uh, can I, yes. We'll talk offline. You can send me an email and, and we'll chat offline. Um, I, I don't think during the uh, a recorded group lecture is, is quite the right platform for that. Just to clarify, the exam will be from 1 to 3.40 p.m. I'll confirm it's two hours and 40 minutes. Uh, I will encourage everyone to verify the start time on the official U of T, sorry, UTM exam schedule. Um, I only say that because I'm actually told not to say officially when the start time is in case I mess it up. Um, I have to officially tell you to go look at the, the official UTM exam schedule, but I will confirm it's two hours and 40 minutes, which means whenever the list of start time is online, add two hours and 40 minutes. So hopefully that, that answers your question. And yes, it is in Eastern Standard Time. Okay, well, if there's no other pressing questions, um, one last thing, I guess this is sort of the credits, the credits for the class um, as we're all tearing up from either sadness or joy, I don't know. Um, I just kind of want to show you how much you've accomplished in, in these six weeks. You know, we started all the way over here with estimation and I guess the introductory material for the class. And look how much we've done. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, review. Uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 chapters. You've done 15 chapters in six weeks. That is incredible for anybody. Yes, we've all signed up for an accelerated summer class. That's true. But that doesn't make the accomplishment any less impressive. 15 chapters in six weeks. That's incredible. Even if you take this class in September, it's 15 chapters in 12 weeks. That's still more than one chapter a week in September. That's hard enough to do. In the summer, we're doing close to three chapters a week. That is crazy. Crazy. So um, yes, it's been hard, but it's hard because of the time frame. And I've been trying my best throughout the semester to give you as much help and support as I can without just making the class ridiculously easy, which I, I hope you can appreciate we can't just do, right? It, it's the same credit you would get in September. So um, please, please give yourselves a big pat on the back. I mean, looking at this, this list of chapters that we've done in these, in these six weeks is just absolutely astonishing. So um, just give yourselves a big, huge round of applause for that one. And anyone who's made it to the end just deserves to at least be recognized for being an absolute trooper. So, um, you know, congratulations on that front. And I think I've echoed that um, in, the, in the announcement on Sunday. So congratulations, everyone. We've, we've done a huge amount of work and you should be very proud of, of everything that we've covered in the six weeks. Um, if there's nothing else, I think that's a, a good note to end on. So I will sign off for now. That's our last lecture. And good luck with your study break. If you have other courses, good luck with those two for your exams. And um, Piazza, email me, whatever you need to do. And, uh, you know, I'll see you on the other side. Okay. Um, good luck, guys. Ciao.